there's a different levels of power. When I pull back and swing, I want to get it all the way back, full swing, so I get the most amount of damage I can on an enemy. Are you determining those movements with the mouse? Yes. So you move the mouse to do it. So I move the mouse forward and I do an overhead swing. I can also parry, so I parry the same way. So if I see him coming to attack me from the... Oh! And I died. And I get it executed. So another thing you can do is do pretty brutal executions. Uh, which are kind of fun though, uh, I have to admit. So maybe I can do a little better. Let me jump in here. Right now we're going to release with two game modes. There's going to be a siege game mode. A siege style rush game mode into... And then there's also going to be the team deathmatch. We're going to release with those two first. We don't want to overwhelm our audience. You know, so we want to make sure that we provide the best, uh, ma uh, the best game mode, and then release new ones for free uh, over time, depending on what the what our community wants. If they want more team style game modes, then we'll give them those. If they want something that's, you know, a bit more complex and complicated, then we're going to work on those as well. We're also going to be working on some type of tournament mode that we'll release at a later point. We're also going to have mountain combat. We don't have that in right now. We're still tweaking. This is still pre-alpha, so it's something to be aware of because you see a lot of, uh, you know, pre-alpha HUD elements like, the, you know, this, the, the visuals for indicating your, sw your swing and, you know, how far you've uh, actually, you know, how hard you're attacking. Those things are all going to change, like where I'm being attacked from. So this guy with the crossbow is taking advantage of my, me being, uh, you know, having my back turned to him, which is a good thing to do because they're at a disadvantage. Now, as you can see, there's a lot of things that can impact your swing and your blade. So you have to be really smart about your swing. So swinging a broad swing, if there's something, uh, something next to you, you're actually going to hit that and impact that object. There's a huge amount of physics in this game, it, it, including if you're both fighting against each other, you both have your swords out and you swing simultaneously, you can hit and kind of do this, uh, you know, unintentional parry or an attack parry. You would also might want to pull out your dagger. Everybody has a dagger. So you want to pull out the dagger and it's much faster and you can, you know, you can attack in a much smaller area and swing more wildly and, and more less likely to get, you know, your attack blocked by a, another object or another player. Oh, I could have, uh, you can heal one of your players. The right, this character I've selected a perk that it enables me to help out my teammates. So I can kind of try and, uh, and heal them. So you know, you're, you're, we're gonna have so many different types of perks. So that's a defensive perk. We're gonna have offensive perks. We're gonna have mounted perks. So you, you can pick a perk to spawn in as, um, as, a, as a mounted player, or and then you can add another perk so your mount has armor and different things like that, and you'll be able to have a lance as your primary weapon. So you'll want to create a custom profile that's for when you're on a mounted horse, and you select those perks and everything that goes with that. There is friendly fire. You, of course, take a bit less damage because we, we want it to be a bit forgiving, especially for those doing an accident, and, and kind of reduce griefers as well. <laughs> but you'll probably always have griefers in that situation. So as you can see, you'll go into a first-person perspective when you have like a bow or if you have a crossbow out. Uh, that, you know, we just want to give you the best visual situation possible. We want to make sure things are intuitive and, and, you, know, and you can make the best move and, you know, and so nothing's blocking you, nothing feels like inhibitive. People love to run from you in this game. I've never seen a game where more people run from you. <laughs> uh, he got across on the picnic table. So I'll start healing my friend. So I can basically come and start healing him.
Oh, took him out of the execution. So you're not impervious and during executions, and my friend revived me. <laughs> and now he's being executed. <laughs> And as you can see right now, this is all placeholder name tags as well, so these aren't the final art, but what we want to do is we want you to be, always know where your teammate is, and we want to make the, the enemies uh, apparent, but also elusive. We don't want their name tags floating everywhere and you just can find your, your enemy. So we, you know, we want being sneaky as an archer to, to, you know, to actually have a value. This guy's attacking the bush, I'm going to try to keep him doing that. <laughs> oh! We're looking to release the, the end of summer, and it's going to be on PC first, and and then uh, coming to Mac. What I personally would have liked to have seen in, in, in a Bioshock game is sort of a broader range of enemies. And I think um, in Bioshock Infinite, we really want to have a sort of a class of enemies that had a, a sort of a, a, a more imaginative range of powers. And we came up with this concept called the heavy hitters, who are enemies that are sort of used to not just be more powerful, but also to augment the abilities of the more traditional Bioshock enemies. You're gonna come across them in, in certain areas of the game and they're gonna provide a really unique challenge. You know, we wanted a, an AI that really expressed sort of the, the very sort of clear system of beliefs the founders have and, 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 and a heavy hitter that would sort of represent that. And the Motorized Patriot is a, um, is sort of the embodiment of that. And they came up with this idea of this creepily motorized, like Hall of Presidents animatronic George Washington. It was specifically the face, specifically this weird, like porcelain child dolls, you know, poor rendering of George Washington. That kind of clinched it. Everybody saw it and said, okay, well, we, can, we can roll with that. It's one of those rare moments where you kind of all come together and you realize, okay, this is this is gonna work. We're all on the same page here. Let's just move forward with what we got. I could use a turret! On it! Booker, the gear! So the motorized Patriot, a um, couple of things make him really special besides the aesthetic of him. One is that he's, unlike most of the enemies, he's completely fearless. Um, he doesn't have a sense of self-preservation, so he'll just keep coming at you and coming at you and coming at you. You know, despite the fact that you face many different kinds of enemies in this game, you clearly can't reason with this one. He's just gonna keep coming forever, you know? He is sort of a clockwork terminator. The other cool thing about him, he's got this um, Gatling gun called a pepper mill. And once you destroy the Patriot, Booker can actually um, go pick up the, the pepper mill and actually use it as a heavy weapon. And that's the only place he can get it, was from a, a destroyed motorized Patriot. I mean, I also like that, you know, as he starts to take serious damage, his head will, he actually loses the Washington mask and it reveals his sort of, his sort of metal skeleton underneath. The thing I like most about this guy is that I think he's pretty readable as what he does. You know, he's a fairly simple guy. He's not, he's not a Swiss army knife. He's a guy with a big gun and I think that reads pretty well. He's got this incredible sense of heaviness. He's relentless and just hearing sort of the, the things he's saying is both funny and kind of terrifying, but he's, you know, a deadly, deadly enemy. Um, I think first-person shooter players are really going to enjoy Planetside 2 because of all the different avenues to play the game. Um, there's air vehicles, ground vehicle gameplay. Unlike a lot of other shooters out there, there's no limitations on that stuff. It's not like you have to wait for the helicopter to respawn before you can jump into it. You can just jump into it and get it and kick ass with it for a while if you want to. But there's also completely unique classes. It's not just a different backpack that you have when you're running around in a max. You're moving slower, you have two gigantic chain guns on your arms. 
you're playing the game much differently when you're playing that class than when you're playing a light assault class. So there's a lot more depth of different kinds of combat roles that you can have in Planet Side 2 than any other shooter that I know of. Each one of our classes has weeks worth of character customization unlocks, uh, different skills that you can unlock, different certifications that you can unlock. Each one of our vehicles does as well. So there's a significant amount of investment that you can do in your character in the game. But I think one of the things that separates Planet Side the most isn't just the depth, the MMO style depth, but it's the persistence of the world. Um, I love playing Battlefield, I love playing Modern Warfare, but when you, when, you, uh, when you blow up the last MCOM station in a Battlefield match, the match is over, the map switches and you're on to something new. Planet Side, when I capture that base, that base is mine until somebody comes and takes it back from me. It creates a much more, like a deep sense of ownership towards the thing that you just did. Your outfit goes and captures this base that nobody in your, in your empire has been able to capture from one of the other empires for weeks or months or whatever. That's a really strong feeling of accomplishment. And now that base is yours and you, they have to come back and get it back from you. Um, I think that level of competition, that sort of meta kind of macro competition is something that no other games really have and it's something that's going to be really, really exciting for people who are used to playing shooter games. So one of the things that's super important to us in making a competitive game is making sure that we have a really uh, even competitive landscape all the time. And that means for us that we don't want a five-year player to be able to just beat the crap out of a five-minute player. We really want it to be uh, equal depending on what loadout they have, who got the drop on who, and really come down to player skill in terms of who wins. So, for instance, we have lots of different items that you can unlock to play the game in different ways. But they're really about playing the game in different ways, not better. I might get a weapon that fires slower, but each bullet does more damage, and I have more recoil on it. So it's balanced against the other weapons, uh, not more powerful, but it suits my playstyle more. Um, all of our actual gameplay items fit into a paradigm that's like that. And we call it side grades rather than upgrades. So you're unlocking different things that help you in different situations, but nothing that's really going to make you more powerful. And that lets us ensure that the five-minute player and the five-year player are going to be competitive. Obviously, the five-year player is going to have an advantage in terms of understanding the game mechanics better, having a better feel for what the map layout is. But if that five-minute player jumps up behind him and gets a couple shots off on him, he's going to be just as capable of beating him as somebody else. So it's not just like a standard MMO game where your level 60 character walks up to a level 1 character and breathes on him and he dies, and the level 1 character can just like sit there and poke at him all day long and it does nothing. We want it to be as even and as competitive as possible across all levels of player play. especially this year, 2012, because uh, it's the 20th anniversary of this game. Exactly 20 years ago, I was working 15 hours a day uh, to try to make uh, this uh, exist. So before going deep inside the, the conception of the game, just want to tell you a few things about me before this game, because uh, it's important, because it helps to understand from where uh, came the inspiration. So. Uh, early 80s, my father uh, got a computer shop, who was named Videomatic, uh, it was uh, in France, I'm French, and uh, I was uh, helping customers with computers, repairing uh, their computers, and uh, <coughs> here I made uh, a game in uh, 88, uh, which was uh, popcorn, it was a breakout freeware, nothing very uh, important, but uh, Infogrames, uh, called, saw this, this game and uh, called me to, uh, to work uh, at, uh, at uh, Infogrames. But something which is the most important thing is that my father's shop was also a VHS movie tape rental shop. 
So I was working uh, days and night uh, in this shop. So at night, uh, when I was bored uh, programming, I watched movies. I maybe watched all the movies uh, I can find uh, in the shop, and I was very, very fond of all the horror movies. I was 20 plus years old at this time, and uh, my heroes uh, were uh, uh, George Romero, Dario Argento. Uh, I loved all those uh, movies. Uh, I loved zombies. And uh, something which is very interesting is the structure of that kind of movies, uh, all the 70s uh, horror movies, is that usually you are one guy or a group of guys entering a special environment and just tries to survive. Look at the, the headline of uh, Amityville. The scenario of Alone in the Dark is written on it, for God's sake, just get out. And that was the main inspiration for that. But I didn't know that uh, at, uh, at this time. I also, uh, at the, I was 20 years old, playing a lot of role-playing game also uh, with my friend at this time. And uh, especially Dungeon and Dragon, I played a little bit uh, Call of Cthulhu because actually I didn't like it. The character, uh, character sheet was so huge and it was so uh, difficult. Okay, but I'll be back uh, on, um, on that later. So I joined Infogrames in 99. Uh, I was doing some programming stuff, uh, low level uh, function, graphical function and everything. And one day, I was involved in the conversion of a game uh, which is uh, Alpha Waves. It was named Continuum here. We were in 90. Uh, the name of the game was The Cube uh, at this time. Christophe de Dinochin is the creator of this game. And I did the conversion, the port, from the Atari ST uh, to uh, PC. It was uh, all ASM code. So I worked for six months uh, on this game. And uh, so I spent six months inside a rotating cube because it was a game. You can see it at the GDC uh, play uh, part. There is a demonstration of uh, this game. It's a bouncing uh, shape and it's uh, the first plat 3D platform game. And so I spent six months with this rotating cube around me and it, it obsessed me. I was always thinking, oh, there is something to do with, um, with 3D. And um, I didn't know yet quite exactly, but uh, uh, my imag imagination was very, very motivated. So, okay, uh, we can modelize something more, more uh, better than just uh, small shapes uh, like this. And I was thinking about uh, 3D characters. And I said, okay, there is something to do with uh, 3D characters. And one day, it came quite quickly. Everything went very smoothly and logically. And uh, one day, I have this idea. It was my first vision of the game. I wanted to have articulated and skin 3D characters with um, first 3D zombies. I was really, really say, okay, now it's possible. I can do um, a game with uh, 3D zombies. Uh, my favorite game at this time were uh, adventure and uh, action games. So it had to be an, um, an, adventure, uh, an adventure game with some uh, action. I'll go deeper in that uh, later. And about how to play, because we were in the uh, early uh, 90s, uh, we couldn't manage many characters, uh, dialogues, and everything. Say, so, okay, it's a game, you are just alone, because uh, it was just convenient. Say, so, no human interaction, no dialogue, things like that. And uh, where, when can this game um, exist. Uh, the year uh, 1920 uh, is very convenient to, because uh, uh, there is electricity, so you can have light, but uh, there is no electronic, there is no complicated stuff. So it was perfect for, for the date, uh, the place. Uh, the idea came from horror movies, an old mansion, uh, an old man haunted manor for the place. And the scenario, uh, just get out alive. You enter the situation, you enter the house, and you just have to exit the house um, alive. Something I knew uh, since the beginning is that uh, I needed to have some text to read because uh, to make something very scary, uh, and especially uh, back uh, in, at this time, with just a few polygons, that's something that is not very uh, frightening. 
So I knew that I needed the text to, to put a situation to have a very heavy background story uh, for, for the game. And so something I understood very quickly too is that um, with the, the polygons, the number of polygons, the amount of polygons I can put in the engine at this time was not very, very uh, big. So um, I, thought, I thought that um, um, I need some 3D backgrounds, but which were not made with polygons. So uh, I had the idea, I can take pictures of a real mansion, an old one, and then my, my 3D fits on those pictures to have those uh, 3D uh, characters uh, inside the, uh, the game. Actually, you, if you know the game, it's not like this at the end, and uh, you would see uh, why. Okay, so I had at Infogrind, a good friend, who was named Didier Chanfray, and uh, I explained him my, my vision of the game. 3D zombies uh, in a house, and you, you, are, you need to get out and fight monsters in this adventure game, and uh, Didier did this drawing. And uh, this is really the, the, the first uh, thing that was done on uh, Alone in the Dark, and uh, this was very a uh, good inspiration. I, uh, I kept, we kept this drawing above my desk for the world development. Each time somebody was asking, uh, you are working uh, on what, say, at this look. Uh, and uh, actually, Infogrimes uh, didn't really uh, believe in it at this time. Uh, so for the first time of my life, because uh, I did games uh, for the, the previous 10 years uh, before, uh, it was the first time uh, where the amount of work seems very huge, because Usually you think about the game with a few sprites and everything. You do a quick prototype in two hours to see how the game works. But I needed things that just didn't exist at this time. Uh, 3D characters, articulation, it means tools. So I started uh, my first tool. I needed a 3D modeler, but we were uh, early uh, 90s. I never saw a professional modeler. A modeler that existed at, at this time were quite simple with those three views to edit a, a few things. So I needed mine. Say, so OK, let's do um, a modeler. And as I told you, I was so obsessed by this 3D rotating cube that I decided to make my own editor. And you, in this editor, you um, edit your, your mesh, but in just one 3D view. Everything is based on this uh, rotated cube, and you can move a grid inside, inside of it, placing your points, uh, drawing lines, and, uh, and uh, polygon. The tool was in uh, EGA mode, for those who know <laughs> the PC at this time. It was a high resolution mode, 640 by 350. The pixels uh, were not square. And uh, uh, these tools allows to create the, the, the model of the game the object, the characters, and everything. Uh, put not texture, because it was uh, flat uh, polygons, but I did some kind of materials uh, on them to, to be able to have a little bit of variety uh, for them. And uh, with this tool, uh, you can also edit uh, real-time uh, animation. Again, I'll be back uh, on this uh, later. Uh, so I needed also another tool. Um, a tool to be able to edit the, the, the backgrounds, actually, to put collisions and to make fit my 3D function on the picture. Uh, because, as I told you, I was sure that I cannot use polygons for the background because it was not, uh, I couldn't put enough polygons to have a very nice, uh, nice uh, scenery. Uh, so I did this tool to, uh, where you were able to put some wireframe cubes in it. Uh, trying to uh, make them uh, to make the collision fits to the um, on the imported uh, pictures. Something that uh, you need also to remember is that uh, in '91, digital uh, camera didn't exist, so we had to take picture with a real camera, then uh, then scanned. We, we had one scanner in four grams, so uh, and then try to make the my routines fit, but uh, my. 3D projection system 
uh, was very, very too simple, and the, with the camera and the, the, the wide angle needed to have some nice, uh, uh, large enough view, uh, it was really uh, not possible uh, with the, what I think. So, what I thought at this time, say, okay, I need and drawn backgrounds. And so the tool Sunedit, which was meant for put the collision on uh, real uh, pictures, actually was used to create the the the, the rooms of the of the room. And uh, you see what how it works yeah, yeah. just after. Yeah. At this time, at Infogrames too, they had a trainee uh, programmer. They didn't know what to do with him. Say, okay, do you need somebody? Say, okay, great. Uh, give me uh, Frank and uh, Frank de Girolami uh, worked on the on the, this tool, and uh, it will it will be the, the the project manager of the second one. But okay, it's, it's, we are <laughs> previewed that. So, as you see here on the screen, that's the kind of view that uh, Senedit uh, generated. It was a wireframes cube. Uh, that describing the, 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 the collisions and all the walls and floor of, uh, of the room. And it was not an, offic an official pro project at this time at Infogrames, so I was just working on my ID. They didn't believe in it. And uh, so I had an idea. I tr uh, created with this tool the first room, actually not the first room of the game, a room for, for testing. Uh, and I put those four camera views uh, on a floppy disk, and I gave it to all the artists, uh, to the artists in Instagram, telling them, okay, um, I want to work with somebody who, who is really motivated. So uh, it's not official, it's not uh, from the direction, just from myself. If after the work, you want to uh, draw something with that, uh, just do it. I explained them that, okay, obviously they didn't see those pictures at this time. I explained them, okay, it's like a kid coloring sheet. Uh, use the old deluxe paint. We used deluxe paint at this time. Photoshop didn't exist too. And uh, I asked them to, to, to make things uh, because I was also very worried about the integration. When you have 3D characters, Laures, uh, flat polygons, I wanted to have them very well integrated. So I asked them, okay, you put colors on the wall, try to have the maximum of flat surfaces, but with a lot of details to make uh, the, the, the picture look like a real, <laughs> real picture. Um, so I explained that. And actually, just two of them uh, gave me an answer. Uh, well, you need to know that Infogrames was 35 people at this time. So it was not a, a huge company. Uh, a guy gave me uh, some background uh, which looked like Prince of Persia. It was, didn't fit the, the ambience I wanted. And uh, Yael Barros, uh, who did those four pictures, the four first pictures of the, the prototype of the game. She came from a, a real art school. Um, same thing at this time. Um, school for video games or for uh, digital uh, graphics didn't exist. But uh, in this school, uh, they had uh, an Amiga. And uh, when she saw video games of this time with tiles uh, and sprites, uh, eight colors and everything, she was also convinced that there is something to do better with, uh, with video games. So for her, it was the perfect uh, fit. So uh, she worked. Um, Actually, she went back to his school uh, um, because I also had a, a PC uh, at this time too. Um, and uh, something that you need to know that uh, she became my wife and the mother of my children. <laughs> okay, so now I have 3D backgrounds with collisions. I didn't find back the wireframe of those pictures, sadly. Okay, so I started to make my first hero because I needed a hero to put in those uh, background pictures. Uh, it was called Main Zero. It was my, uh, my crash test uh, dummy. Uh, it was very, very uh, simple because I, I needed something very, very quickly to just test can it work. And that was, um, so what you are seeing here is the first uh, hero of, uh, of Alone in, um, in the Dark. 
made with my tools. This is the animation part of the, of the tool. Actually, this animation was never put in the game because uh, you cannot run like this uh, in, a, in a house. But uh, it allows to, uh, to edit RAM. I'll be back on the, how it works uh, after because that's very important for, um, for the game. So now I have 3D backgrounds. I have a 3D hero. So let's make the first prototype of Alone in the Dark. We were in September 91, and actually uh, it works. Uh, I have a 3D character that can direct control with the keyboard. The interface of the PC game at this time were just keyboard driven. Uh, some joystick existed, but they were more uh, intended for uh, uh, flight simulators or things like that. So it was all the, controlled by the, by the keyboard. Um, Sun Edit also allowed to uh, edit all the mask uh, that is put. There is no Z buffer. This is a 2D picture. So uh, you, uh, I, um, <coughs> you had a zone on the, on the floor that tells uh, which uh, picture you need to put in front of the characters. And the camera switching used, uh, used this, uh, this done uh, too. But uh, it, it worked. I have my, my character uh, my uh, walking in that uh, in, the, in this room. Actually, we learned a lot from uh, from this uh, demo because you can see the camera are not very uh, efficient. This one is fine, but uh, some of them uh, you have too much walls or too much ceiling. And uh, I understood at this time that it was more important to put the camera in the game, showing the biggest part of the ground to uh, make to give to the player a, a, a good vision of where it can go and what it can do in this. Oh yes, uh, did you see that window and the bird uh, coming, <laughs> coming in? I don't know where this, from where this idea came from. Maybe it was Hitchcock uh, movie or uh, I don't know, but I wanted to have monster coming in from windows. So if in another game you see a dog coming uh, uh, in through the window, uh, remember these 12 polygon birds wrecking the first 3D win <laughs> window uh, in the game. Uh, we also learned from, from this demo to avoid to have a, a short reverse shot camera because it was very disturbing for, for, for the player. So it was working. And uh, then I shown that to Infogram, say, okay, look, that's what I am I'm thinking, uh, thinking about uh, in the, for this game. And uh, they say, oh, okay, great, the concept was, was approved. So, I had my home team for the first time, obviously Didier Chanfray, uh, who worked uh, on the, the, the black and white picture you saw, Yael Barroz, and Franck de Girolami, uh, who became uh, uh, integrated uh, inside, the, inside the team. Uh, I asked Infogrames for, um, to have plan, um, mention, old mention from uh, those old years, and they provided me uh, Franck Manzetti. Uh, I worked a few days uh, with him making the, the plane of the, of the mansion, the, the full plane. So Didier is involved in the team now. So now I have a 2D artist that became a 3D artist for the first time. So he did the second uh, hero of the game. It's called Main 2 because the first one was Main 0 because it was, uh, the number came from a programmer and uh, Main 2 is the second one because it was numbered by an artist. <laughs> um, so, um, as you can see here, uh, I don't remember the exact amount of polygon, I think it's 140 polygons. That was so huge, I did, wasn't sure that uh, it was not too much. Uh, as you can see here, the way of animated character, it was not a hierarchy of object. It was a hierarchy of points. Actually, one mesh was just a big, big a cloud of points, and um, each point got, uh, was um, attached to a group, and the rotation of each group was another point from, uh, from that cloud. Um, this is the, the, the first polygon hero with the, the flat shaded polygon and some kind of uh, materials on the, the chest of the, of the hero to have some variety uh, for that. Uh, let's load uh, an animation. I 
chosen this animation because uh, it's very special souvenir to, to me. We were working with Didier, and uh, okay, I want that the character is able to walk, but I want also him to be able to run. And Didier said, how do you run in a house? And I show him <laughs> running, <laughs> running be between the desks uh, in, the, in the company. And he did that just to have fun of me. Like he said, but you are running like this. So, OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. But actually, the, in the final game, the animation is not very different than this one. He tried to make it less funny. But <laughs> so that's my way of running, they said. Um, OK, just to show you uh, how the tool works, each time you click on a part of the body, it selected the group. And then you can uh, modify the three angles, because all the mat mathematic functions were trigonometry, not mat matrix at this time. So it was just a dream matrix. Um, so you can, uh, like an articulated puppet, put uh, all the position of the, of the body. Uh, I wanted to have uh, this, obviously, to have animation. But something also that you need to know that uh, in the um, early 90s, uh, PCs were slow, but we are evolving very, very quickly. So you have a lot of and big differences in speed between computers. So I decided to have this system uh, to, to be able to uh, adapt that to, for the animation system to adapt itself to the speed of the computer. So if you have a very slow computer, you just have the basic frames. And um, here I just modified it a little bit to show you that you can put the, the time you want uh, between the, the, the frames. Uh, so it was very, very convenient because if you have a very, very fast PC, uh, you have very, very smooth and nice uh, animations. Uh, this animation is just four frames. That was also so convenient for the memory. Uh, Didier did also the first monster of the game. It was a kind of zombie chicken. <laughs> don't know exactly uh, what it is. Uh, also the sphere were very convenient to give uh, some volume to the object without using too much, uh, too much polygon because I was very hard on him saying, no, no, it's too much polygon. It was always too much uh, polygon. And look at this uh, attack animation for this monster. It's just uh, three frames. Uh, so it means in memory, I don't remember exactly, 40 uh, bytes. Uh, that was so, so cool. We were very, very happy with what we saw at this time. That was so, so new, so, so, so impressive. That was very, very uh, cool. OK, so now I have a, re a real hero, real monsters, uh, some plan for the, for the mansion. So I also did it. I'll be quick uh, on that. I needed a scripting language because something I understood very, very soon is that uh, as, as I was the, the main programmer and uh, alone, uh, I need to separate work between uh, people who produce the content of the game and uh, people who are uh, programming the, uh, the engine itself. So I did this kind of object uh, interpreted uh, language. But it helps me also to understand uh, something. With uh, 3Desk, Senedit, and my scripting language, I understood that if you do uh, for a game, and it's still true nowadays, uh, dedicated tools, uh, it's very, very uh, efficient because it helps, uh, because the, it, uh, it keeps the direction. Because every artist working on the game, you give them the maximum freedom, but inside the constraint uh, you want and inside the direction you want. So uh, if you have a lot of dedicated tools to a game, it helps to keep the vision and uh, the efficiency too, because the tool provides exactly the data you need for, uh, uh, for the game. So we were working, and we are now in December 91, and this is the first room you know uh, in the game, the first room you see uh, in the um, final, uh, final game. But here you can, for the first time, we had fights. Yes, he runs well. Yeah. That's wonderful. Uh, okay, so you can push object. A monster can see you, detect you, uh, uh, attacks you. The camera assist switching system was working quite nice, nicely. Um, 
the monster can attack you, you will see here the first uh, fight, uh, manual fight uh, system. Yes, there is, uh, yeah, can give punch. And also this animation, which was removed, this one, <laughs> but, but not very, very elegant. Uh, the, the, but, but it just, it works. You can fight monsters, and uh, you can have this camera switching. The game was uh, really here. There is no uh, OSD on the tool. Yeah, OSD here, it's for the debug mode, just to show you some collision and um, a little bit uh, of the underground of the, of the game. And I w but didn't want any OSD. That was the inspiration from the, the movie. And I say, I don't want you just play the game. You're inside the house. I want that you are completely immersed. Uh, your life points and uh, inventory system uh, was another screen, uh, but when you play, you just have the, the 3D uh, vision of the, of the game. Uh, so here you can see the, 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 in the, the orange lines are the collision artists have to, to draw the, the backgrounds, and uh, you can see the, the, the small box for uh, the heat detection when, uh, when you, you fight. There was um, the, those, um, the collision boxes were attached to some group. So it allows to have very, very different kind of, um, of um, attacks for the, the, the game. Okay, then Call of Cthulhu, because Alone in the Dark was very often, is very often, um, <coughs> compare, oh, not compare, um, a lot of people say that the inspiration is Call of Cthulhu. Actually, the inspiration, as I told you, was more the movie. But the story of Call of Duty is something interesting because I ask uh, to Infograms, okay, I need a writer because, okay, do you see here it's an action game, but I don't want to do an action game. Alone in the Dark is not an action game. It's an adventure game with a few uh, action in it. So I needed those text. Uh, so I need a very good, um, good writer. At, and at, this, at this time, Infograms uh, was talking with Chaosium, um, who, uh, which owned the Call of Cthulhu license. And they asked me, is Call of Cthulhu something that uh, interesting you for the game, Lovecraft? I say, okay, Lovecraft, just perfect. Um, uh, I knew uh, the, the books of, uh, of him, but please, no Call of Cthulhu, because as I told you, uh, the character sheets were so awful. So they, they gave me Hubert Chardot, uh, he never worked on a game before. He was a good writer. That he knew very well Lovecraft, and he's very uh, talented. So uh, we start to work with um, with the Uber. The license was refused by Chaosium. They say no, it's not Call of Cthulhu. And I know it's not Call of Cthulhu. I don't want to have any character sheet uh, in it. And uh, so they say it's too far from the RPG. I say yes, I know, but this is an adventure game. I, it's not an RPG, uh, an RPG game. Uh, so the team now, we have a writer, we have two D artist, uh, we have, uh, so while we were maybe six or seven people at this time, that was the, 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 the full team. And uh, so we were ready to, to be able to, to uh, put the content of the game. So we did a very famous thing. Everybody in the team uh, remembers remember that so, uh, so well. The, this three-day meeting, uh, the whole team was in the same room. We ate a lot of pizza. And um, I, I did it as a game master, say, okay, because I knew I, have, I had the, the, the plan of the mansion. Uh, I knew what kind of action, what kind of puzzle, things I wanted in the game. So um, I, I played it as a game master with them. Say, okay, we are in the attic. I want to, st to start the game in the attic because you need to go out of the game. So I asked Hubert, find me something to explain why you start in the attic. And it was the same way of working each time. Okay, now we have this monster. Uh, okay, you cannot kill him uh, with your hands or with a gun. You can need to find this statuette or this special, uh, special knife. Right uh, in this book you find here, you need to put this clue of uh, the way of passing this monster or this, um, this part of the game. So everybody of the team takes no took note about what they have to do, all the list of all animation, all monsters, all books uh, that need to be written, and everything. So after those three days, we had the whole red thread of the game from the start to, to, uh, to the end of the game. 
everybody uh, knew what they have to do for the few months that um, still uh, <coughs> needed to, uh, to, uh, to make the game advance. This was very, very memorable. Uh, Hubert Chardot uh, said a um, few uh, times later uh, that uh, he learned his job in three days because he saw everything, because he, he, he didn't know how to work the game and say, okay, uh, so how number of animation you need, how many characters, how many plays, how many, everything, three days for the, the whole game. Uh, the production team ground up uh, a bit too because uh, the uh, total amount of um, background in the game of um, 3D camera views was 170 uh, views. It was too much for just one artist. So Jean-Marc Torella uh, and Frédéric Bourgin um, joined the team. Jean-Marc did uh, almost all the caves uh, under the, the ground. And Philippe Vacher also came us for the music. Something you need to know also, at the beginning of the 90s, uh, PCs uh, were not very good for doing sounds. You have the buzzer, it was not very efficient. You have some ad-lib FM calls with uh, switch channels, uh, FM chip. Uh, again, for instance, alpha waves, all the sound effects are done with these uh, FM chips. But uh, early 90s, the Sound Blaster uh, just <laughs> arrived. That was so amazing, especially for a game like this, because we can do samples, real samples, for the first time on PC. So for all the squeaks of the steps, uh, when you open the door, all the, the scream of the monster and everything, it helped so much to have a realistic uh, ambience and game at this time. That was very, very something very important for the, the game. Okay, let me just do a quick step to the end of the game because there is something quite funny that happened. I don't know if you noticed in all the videos and pictures you saw um, uh, for now, is that all the, the characters you saw just have a sphere for the head. Yes, we were in September 92, uh, master state, but we still have no head, head for the hero. Because since the beginning, I, I told Didier when he, uh, he um, created the, the characters and Monster Hunter 6, I, I will have a voxel head system. You see, it will be just marvelous with a lot of details for, for the head. We can have animation on heads and everything, but I never had the time to, to do it. So he said, oh, we need something. Didier said, okay, let me take care of that. And he did, he did 3D uh, polygons, uh, polygons for, uh, for the, the head. That's why in the game, the head is very, very static. There is not a lot of animation because all the animation were done. So it was just quickly try to uh, reparse all the animation to add little movement for the head. But uh, we were <laughs> very quite, quite late. And where this is very funny, this is that those in April 92, Infogram asked me, we need visuals for the communication. I say, oh. <laughs> You need visuals, but I have no head. Okay, never mind. Didier and Yael drawn some with Photoshop, uh, sorry, Deluxe Paint, uh, <laughs> and drawn head on the screenshot of, of the game. And that's very funny because if you still look on the first box of the game, the pictures at the end of the box are those pictures with a fake head on it. And even in the game, in the main menu, if you don't touch a key, uh, you go to a slideshow, and the picture in the slideshow are those pictures too. So they are not the same in the game. That didn't have time or forget to, to modify those uh, those pictures. Okay, so let's back to the game itself too, because why this game uh, was the first name, the first it was later actually first survival horror, because I have uh, I had a lot of ideas about how to, to scare the player. I told you the main important stuff is the books because imagination is stronger than polygon. So if you have this very, very heavy ambience, very dark story, so it helps to, to, to put this heavy uh, ambience in the game. But I realized also something else. In an adventure game, you walk 80% of the time. And I say, oh, if you want to 
big, put big pressure on the player, just if scare him on what he does all the time, just walking. That's why in the first corridor, the soul tracked uh, under your feet and you just die like this. Usually in the game, you never uh, do an unvoidable trap like this, but it was to put the pressure. It worked so well. Testers, when they're playing, each time they saw a, a darker pixel somewhere, say, be careful, be careful. It just happened once in the game, but now you are afraid of walking. It was the same thing for opening door, open the door, you have a monster just behind, okay, so now you'll be afraid for opening every door. Same thing, even the books, you need to read, the, you needed to read the, the, the books in the game. Some books, you just open them, you die. Say, okay, uh, you use a weapon in the game, use it, uh, it breaks. Say, wow, and the limited inventory, because that's something also that, uh, it already existed in game, but I like this fear because it's each time you go to a trip, you make your, you pack your, your stuff, say, oh, I don't need to forget that and to forget that. And that's something that uh, you can do with limited inventory because sometimes you have to put down some objects, so maybe I need them later. Okay, but you can go back and pick them up um, again. And uh, limited inventory means also limited ammunition. I know a lot of people say that uh, the game was frightening because of the amount of uh, ammunition. But actually, um, it's what's not important because this is an adventure game. This is not a shooter or a slasher. So you didn't need actually a lot of ammunition. I know it's very, um, uh, it makes people most, more, more confident to have a big gun and everything. But no, if you, if you read all the book, you always have clues to kill a monster with just one action. It can be a dedicated object or a way of avoiding him. So actually, you can finish the game with almost all the ammunition you can find in the game. But because I really wanted to force the player to find other solutions than just brutal force. It's not a shooter. It's an adventure uh, game. And as I said, all clues are in the book. For instance, this room. I read um, some walkthroughs of the game, say shoot quickly the six uh, or five, uh, uh, five uh, zombies. No, just put a pot of soup on the table and they will go to eat and you don't have to fight them. The fight with the, this knight is difficult to, because you need this sword. Okay, read the book and you will learn the story why this knight uh, can be easily killed with the, the statuette. This one is uh, special uh, in the game, the, the, the combat with the, the pirate. Because my animation system, okay, interpolates um, in, in between frames, but it also interprets uh, between animations. So I wanted this kind of, of special gameplay. The pirate actually got a parry animation for each uh, com animation you have, the right attack, the left attack, and the uh, but you can, with the keyboard, change whenever you want the animation, and the interpolation system creates other animation. But the pirate doesn't know that, and he just has a full parry animation for the left and a full parry animation for the right. So the trick was you just start to attack from the right, and you find it by going to the left, and the pirate was continuing to, to protect itself on the wrong side, and it was in this way very uh, easy to, uh, to defeat. Some monsters were quickly killed with uh, with gun, but as I said, all clues were in books, so you can avoid or find easy solution for a lot of uh, monsters. Let's just have a look at some underground fights. Yeah, this is the door. Each time you die in the game, killed by a monster, you can see this animation. A zombie is dragging you to the sorcerer cave. You can see quite often this animation <laughs> while playing. And it's something funny too, you will see just after why. Okay, so. The final game, October 1912, uh, 
uh, everybody knows this picture because this is the first picture you see in the game when you run the game. And uh, I like it very much because um, in all the things I wanted uh, in this game, there is also this detail, but I, I like it. You see the lamp at the bottom of the screen, the petrol lamp. And actually, this object is the one that is used at the end to kill the sorcerer. I just like this idea that the first object is the one you need to finish, uh, uh, finish the, um, the game. And uh, I have a confession, actually, to do. In October 92, I hated this game. <laughs> Two years after, at the beginning, we were so excited. Everything was so... Uh, so new, so, so, so impressive, but two years after seeing those 3D characters inside the game, nothing was new actually. But what I saw is what, okay, the trajectory, for instance, when you throw an object, just a line, it's not a well curve, because I quickly implemented it at the beginning, uh, just to, to go on in the game. I never had time to modify it, and there is, in the game, I can tell all of them, all the details in the game, I say, wow, this is, so bad done, uh, and especially one thing I hated is that when the characters open the door, you have the camera on the side, but, and you cannot see the corridor or the room just in front of him, but the character itself just see what he's looking at, so you are afraid to go forward, but the characters, he sees if there is something or not, okay, but let me just read something from Lovecraft. Uh, Lovecraft said, the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is the fear of the unknown. So I, okay, so it's fine, huh? you can't see what's happening, so let's be afraid with that. But I really, really thought that people will laugh at me. So I, okay, your game is so stupid. That was really something I, yeah, it was the end of the game. Everybody was really, really tired and everything, and I was really afraid. The, what happened to the game uh, obviously made me change my mind, but uh, that was really, uh, really true at this time. Uh, so, we are almost uh, done. Let me just show you, not the introduction of the game, because I think most of you have seen it, but let me show you the final uh, sequence uh, of the game and the end of the game. Sound, please. because the house now is empty. All the monsters died with the sorcerer, and so you can just go back in the house to visit all the rooms uh, with no monster in it. But uh, <coughs> generally, the testers just wanted to get out. <laughs> so, okay.
another company which was named Adlin Software, where we did another game called Little Big Adventure. It was named Relentless here. Okay, thank you, everybody. So, Uh, okay, for the question, I want to ask to a good friend of mine, uh, Vincent, to join me just to be sure I understand well your question. Okay, if you have any question, please ask. Any question? Hey. Uh, two questions. First off, did you use any of those tools you designed on additional games? Uh, and second off, which was your favorite platform? Which platform actually got it, like, was the best port or the best version, PC version? Uh, okay, so for the tools, actually, uh, no, they uh, belong belonged uh, belong to infograms. They used them for uh, Alone in the Dark 2 and Alone in the Dark 3, but uh, I didn't use them. But, you know, uh, at, when we started the, our new game, at, uh, the 386 uh, existed at this time, so I uh, redid everything in 32 bits mode that was so <laughs> more speed and so more, more uh, efficient, so I never used them uh, uh, again. Actually, I used them last month for <laughs> Presentation, but not for another game. And uh, my best platform is the. Uh, I, I'm obliged to say the, the PC because uh, when I discovered the PC in uh, 87, 88, uh, I really felt in love with this uh, with this machine, and uh, so I really prefer the PC. But uh, the, the ports are usually very, very well done, and uh, and it's very, very nice to see. But uh, I prefer the, the, the PC version. How much did uh, playthrough iteration go into uh, your, your puzzle challenges? Because I remember playing the game and, oh, the monster jumps out of the window, but hey, I can move that, that, that closet in front of the window and block it. But I only know that after it jumps out of the window and kills me the first time. How, how much did your challenge design revolve around repeated playthrough? Uh, yeah, well, the, the way of working at this time was not the same than nowadays. Actually, the tests uh, were done very, very late in the process. Testers were first uh, us, and uh, but uh, I had the same idea during the whole development. So you need to find a way to be able to avoid because if you're not good at fights you need to find a way. So uh, uh, it was done since the first room to be able to push the, the wardrobe in front of the window or the chest on the, on the hatch to avoid the, the monsters. Actually, I'm lying a little bit because some monsters don't have that in the game and you need to fight them because we didn't find uh, a solution. But we didn't uh, do a lot of iteration on it. It was. Uh, uh, if you look at the, the dates, uh, the, the, the first prototype were at the end of uh, 91. So we did the game in, let's say, eight, the, the real content of the game in less than eight months. So uh, we worked a lot and uh, we didn't ask a lot of questions. In fact, are you okay? It works. Yeah, it works. Okay, let's play it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, my question would be did you have a long phase where you just um, did a concept like a pen and paper and designed the world or made a conscious decision where the story takes place in the world? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I tried to do that. The three days meeting. Three days. This is really, yeah, this is three days. We did the whole, the whole game. After, obviously, when um, uh, Franck de Girolami, for instance, was involved in San Edit, but also in the, in the scripting uh, of the game. So each time we test, but we just, sorry, we just test, uh, test ourselves. Say, okay, 
it works. It was like the, 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 the ID from those three days and say, okay, uh, let's, <laughs> let's so have it like this. So the whole floor plan of the house was everything, to, everything in three days? Yes, yeah, we modified a lot, actually. The, the, the mansion plan was modified during the season because sometimes I, oh, uh, for instance, I wanted to start at the attic and the exit were on the first floor, but I wanted to have some surprise, like the whole the cave is under the house. So actually, when you reach the first ground, it's not the end of the game. You have all the part uh, out under the house, and then you need to come back to, uh, but it was done in those three days, and sometimes I, oh, yeah, but this door is not convenient. I prefer that we go here before, so let's move a little bit the, the walls in it. But uh, nothing was really modified after those, uh, those three days, except when really something was not working, but not the plane. The big stuff didn't change uh, after that. We were lucky, I think, very lucky. Okay, uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, what do you think of all the survival horrors that came out after Alone in the Dark, like, you know, uh, Resident Evil and Silent Hill? And the second one is, I don't know who owns the rights for Alone in the Dark now, but has someone ever considered making an HD remake of this game for some platform? I would love an HD remake one day, and I hope it will happen one day. But I think in four grains, uh, all the right, I'm not sure uh, about that, I don't know. Uh, and uh, about the games, the evolution of the game, uh, as I told you, uh, I want in an adventure game. Okay, with action, is there a lot of action uh, actually uh, in the game, but that was the spirit of the game was really adventure. So uh, uh, actually I wasn't very happy with what they did on the sequels uh, of the game. Games in the same uh, Indian spirits uh, that I prefer. It's more Silent Hill or um, recently uh, Alan, Alan Wake, which is closer to, to this kind of uh, the, the spirit I wanted for the game at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, just one question for me. Something I never really understood is uh, why there is a, at the beginning of the game you have the choice to choose between a male character, female character, with different storyline. And did you really expect in 92 female playing this kind of game? Okay, I forgot to say it actually. Merci Alexi. Alexi was one of the testers of the first Alone in the Dark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you Alexi. I forgot to, to, uh, to say it. I was very naive uh, at this time and I believe that if I put a female, female character in the game, a uh, woman will, be, will want to, uh, would have want, uh, wanted to play the game. I was very naive about that. And also something I, did, I, I forgot to say when you saw the animation with the girl, I uh, thought that uh, I can put the same animation for the male character than for the female uh, character, but it's not true. All the animation were redone. And something I also wanted at the beginning is that the story for the uh, things you have to do, not just the story, things you have to do for the female character, uh, to have something different for, for her, but same thing, we didn't have time to, to that, so the story is sadly exactly the same for both uh, characters. <laughs> Hi, uh, I must tell you first that I really admire this game. It, it really scared me when I was very young. And I, I didn't hear anything about the sound, and I remember really afraid of the steps. In, in, so, when did you put the sound in the game? At what moment did it come in the project? Was it really late in the project, or you always planned that sound? Actually, it was uh, quite soon in the game because uh, all those um, the information for what sound, because every step is uh, sound is different. Uh, depending on the ground you are uh, were working on. So it was integrated quite soon in Sen Edit tool, uh, because when you put the, those wireframes collision in the game, you said, okay, the sound, if you work on this collision, is, uh, is this one. So that was something uh, integrated uh, quite, quite uh, soon in the game. Not really at the beginning, because the, the sound artist uh, didn't, uh, wasn't here at the, at the real beginning, but it was very, very soon, because um, since the, this three days meeting, all the sounds were listed during those three days too. So uh, after that, he had the list of everything uh, to put uh, in the game. So uh, 
uh, it was done, uh, yeah, let's say, in the first quarter of the, of the development. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. When I was a little boy, I never thought I'd be so